Okay, so how many of you, when you got up this morning, looked in the mirror and the person looking back at you, you thought this thought, I am a master recruiter, <laughs> just by a show of hands. Okay, so um, I have that thought every morning when I get up. I love recruiting. Now, I love how there's some language that softened it up called agent attraction. However, attraction is about you hoping that you've got a great enough brand, that you're having enough fun, that people are gonna notice what you're doing and flock to you going, oh my gosh, tell me about what you're doing with your real estate career and why you're at eXp. Honest, right? Okay, agent attraction is about you and making it about you. Recruiting is about making it about the other person. So here's what I want to introduce as just a mindset shift when you hear the word recruiter. A recruiter is someone that cares enough about another human being that they're willing to sit down and have a conversation about what's going on for that person, what's working in their life and their business, what's not working, what can be improved, what are their hopes and their dreams and then positioning as the resource to help them get it. So when someone says to you, I don't wanna be a recruiter, or I don't like recruiting, what they're really saying is, I don't care about learning about another person and what's important for them, and then becoming a resource in their life to help them get it. Yes. Recruiting is not a dirty word. Recruiting is one of the most incredible words ever because think about it, each and every one of us have the opportunity to play a small role in a decision that could forever change the trajectory of someone's life. Mm -hmm. Brent was that person for Rick, right? So what we're gonna do is jump in today and it's gonna be a fire hose and I'm a little bit intense, however, it's because I'm excited and I love the topic. You're what, intense? A little bit? A little bit. Yeah, I'm a little bit intense. Um, so how many of you think, oh, I don't know if my timing, like, what's my timing like? You know, there was just, you know, however many years ago, how many agents were there when we came to EXP? 2,400, 2, now there's 38,000. Maybe I missed the boat. How many of you are familiar with something called the Rogers Adoption Curve of Innovation? Yeah. By a show of hands? One person, okay, so here is where we're at. The Rogers Adoption Curve of Innovation is how ideas and technologies and transformational things are accepted into the market. 2.5% of the population are innovators. These are people like Glenn Sanford that run a science experiment that goes right. Where when he tells people the idea, they go, oh my gosh, you're crazy. I can't ever see that happening. Those are the innovators. I'm not an innovator. However, what I am is an early adopter. 13.5% of the population are early adopters. And these are people that they can look at an innovator's idea, they can see the future flash before their eyes and they go, oh yeah, I didn't think of it, but this is gonna be really big. The, the smallest portion of people outside of innovators are these early adopters. This is where EXP is at right now. So time is not created equal. All windows of time are not created equal. Somebody that understands this will know that when you compress time, energy, and effort called massive action into a small window of time at a critical moment in time, that you can create more than what would otherwise take you a lifetime to create. And anybody that's sitting here in this room right now is part of that 13.5%. What happens from that is when enough early adopters get on board, then this next group called the early majority pop up which is 34%. And the early majority are people that are like, wow, well, there's enough people doing this now that um, it's not perceived as a risk. And so they're willing to come on board. The late majority is that group of people that perceive risk that are never willing to take a risk. And then the laggards are the 15% that are still walking around with flip phones. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so here's how innovation works. So if you wonder like, where are we in the stream of time? We're in the early adopter stage, so you could not be positioned more powerfully than you're positioned right now. So we talk about eXp having leverage, and here's how I like to look at it. The model itself is like a Ferrari. Anyone that's in a brokerage that's not with eXp is on a 10-speed bike. 
If we line up at a racetrack and you're with another brokerage on your 10 speed bike and I'm in my Ferrari and we both hit go and go as hard and as fast as we can at the same time, what's going to happen? There is no way that you are ever, ever going to go as fast or as far on your 10 speed bicycle as I'm going to go in my Ferrari because it does not contain the same mechanics. The mechanics of leverage exist within EXP, which make it superior to any other model out there. It doesn't matter what people say or think. Um, so here's, let's talk about this. Now you might be like my husband. I met him in a real estate class at the beginning of 2005 when I was a newly licensed agent. I sat in his class, I came home and I, and I called my mom and I was like, oh my God, I just met the Jesus Christ Sean Connery of real estate. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he was like, the most amazing instructor, like real estate, uh, seriously. Um, and Rick is one of those people who he recruits based on his personality because of who he is, right? I am not that person. And there's not a lot of people that recruit based on personality. It's a small percentage of people. There's no way that you're going to build a scalable organization that's going to be ginormous if it's going to be dependent 100% on you. So this principle of leverage comes into play once you're in EXP building an organization and how do you get the person that is, doesn't view themselves as a recruiter because they don't have the right perspective or mindset shift on that yet. And how do you get someone to fall in love with that behavior and activity so that you can get scalable growth and build an amazing organization? And if you do, here's the power of the model. I'm just going to say this is a legal disclaimer if this ever hits public. It's never going to happen like this. However, if you have five people that you personally attract that cap, that's 14,000 in rev share a year. If you taught those five to do the same thing and they actually did the same thing, you pick up another 80,000 in rev share a year. That's $94,000 of rev share a year. What if they half cap? That's still close to $4,000 a month. Now, what if you had that replicating in your organization? You can see as that replicates, it's the penny that's compounding interest. That's a freaking lot of money. Okay, so third party validation is the leverage of how to build and scale once you're in EXP and going to build an organization. So by a show of hands, how many of you feel super confident around this idea of bringing a senior partner or a colleague into the conversation when you are working on recruiting or prospecting someone? How to do it, what to say, by a show of hands. Okay, so like half of you, would you agree that if you have a set of skills or a system, it no longer becomes personality dependent or experience dependent and anyone can do it? I'm going to give you the system. I'm going to give you the skills so that you can replicate that with anyone in your organization. And if you're willing to do that yourself, uh, the benefits to that. So here's the benefits of third party, party validation. When you say, I've got a team of people that I work with, if you never use third party validation, where's the team? So you're modeling the behavior that you want to communicate as you grow your organization. The second thing is a due diligence process. Everyone is going to go through their own, usually it takes five to seven different exposures before someone's gonna make a decision. So when you bring in a third party validation or multiple different people into the conversation, you're supporting a due diligence process which gives an entirely different perspective, right? Because everyone's going to share their own perspective based on their experience of the same thing. It's like two kids that grow up in the same house and you'll have one talk to the other about their experience growing up and it's like, what house did you grow up in, right? It's the same thing when you're recruiting, having multiple voices to give different perspectives is huge. The support, when you say, oh, what I love about working with EXP is all the support that comes from working together. Well, where's your demonstrating of the support? You can demonstrate that right up front using third party validation. And then commitment. When you say we're committed to helping you grow and they have someone that's not you in the conversation, it's a demonstration of that commitment. And finally, if you do it correctly, you're getting training and skills while making money versus sitting here learning about a concept or an idea, not making money, right? We say that Training doesn't work, work trains. So every time you bring a new prospect to a conversation and have a third party conversation, your job is to sit there and be quiet and listen, listen to how those questions are being answered, listen to the perspectives that are shared, mirror and match, like what can you learn from the posture? What can you learn from the confidence? This is gonna help you skill up faster every time you use a third party validation call 
for one of the prospects that you're working on recruiting. So this is like a foolproof system of like when you see, wow, I could be more efficient, more effective, scale faster. Like why wouldn't I use it, right? We do. So I'm going to give you the anatomy now of what a third-party validation looks like. I'm going to tell you what there is to do, and then I'm going to actually model it for you so that you can have an experience of it. You'll notice on some of these slides that we put EXP experience because would you agree that if you have an experience that you don't care for, you don't really want to have that experience again. If you have an experience that feels amazing, you want to have it over and over again. Would you guys agree? No. Right. So how this came to play, I've been the silent partner in our EXP organization. I'm not responsible for the growth that's happened. However, what I am responsible for is in January after traveling around with our groups, and wanting to crawl under the table as I watched our organization vomit EXP on their prospects, I'm like, oh my God, Rick, this is gonna kill our brand. This is gonna kill the EXP brand. And while enthusiasm is amazing, enthusiasm in the form of vomit on another human being about what you're excited about is not so amazing, right? So what bridges that gap is enthusiasm plus skills is gonna get you results. And so what this is about is scaling up. Like if we're going to be professionals in the industry, if we're going to build a brand that people are like, wow, I just had an experience that I have not had anywhere else. I want to be a part of what's going on here. That is the agent attraction part that comes into play because of the experience that you've been able to create for someone else. So number one is clear the time. Now in the context of a third party validation, we were in Southern California. We did an event for our group down there and one of our main guys set up a meeting with this man that owns a brokerage. He's created huge success and he's big in the community. We had an hour set up. He came to the meeting 15 minutes late that was in his office. We were sitting in the meeting room waiting, right? So this is gonna happen. First thing is, hey, I know we had an hour set up for this meeting. It's not about him being late. Just wanna reconfirm that we're good to the top of the hour because we had an hour set aside. That at the beginning of the conversation gives him the opportunity to say, yeah, that works great. Or it gives him the opportunity to say, I actually only have like 15, 20 minutes right now. So you're able to know the time frame if you check in on the time right up front and work to create the maximum amount of value in that time. If it's a, yeah, go ahead. So make, make sure that you guys get that based on your behavioral style, that 97% of the human public, based on behavioral styles, D-I-S-S-C, you get that? Do any of you have an idea about that? 97% yeah. of humans will have trouble behaviorally asking to clear the time. Mm. It's not comfortable. She has driven it into my head for eight years. <laughs> and it's just day before yesterday, she goes, I heard no clearing of the time. <laughs> the kiss of death is for Rick to do validation calls with me in the car. <laughs> She's on a webinar in the other room, and I'm safe, and she'll come in, she'll go, I heard that. You sucked. <laughs> I never say that. Well, you kind of do. If you know him, you know that he's a little dramatic, and I'm a little direct, so we make the perfect couple. Okay, so clear the time. Like, this is a really important thing. If it's a call, and I've got a call set up for noon, and I'm calling Rick, you know, hey, Rick, it's Casey. We had a call scheduled for noon. Just want to make sure, is this still a good time for you? Right? Because sometimes people will pick up the phone when it's not, and it's just, it's a... There's people that are driven by sincerity, in other words, like the care and the feeling and the coziness. And then there's people that are driven by competence, like do what you say you're going to do when you said you were going to do it and we're good. If not, you just lost my trust. So which one do you think I am, sincerity or competence? Um, I'm competence. Which one's Rick? Sincerity. You guys, I love we've only been up here for like 10 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> So you got to be able to speak with and work with who, without knowing which someone's based in, this process is going to support you regardless of if someone's sincerity based or competence based. It, it doesn't matter. You don't need to know that much. It's just the person who's sincerity based is going to go, oh, they cared enough about me to check in on my schedule. And the person that's competence based is going to go, wow, they really respect my time. Boom. What I think of you just went up a notch. Yeah. So clearing the time while it seems like a small and significant thing is such a huge thing if you're going into a meeting or to a call so second thing is setting the context um, the meeting that we were in in southern california last week i mean this guy is amazing at recruiting he's recruited nine people on his front line in the last 30 days 
and he didn't clear the time so I jumped in and did it in the meeting because we hadn't yet taught him this and he didn't set the context for the meeting so it's kind of like well you know we're like here thanks you know for coming together and it's just it's that awkward moment where it's like how do we actually start into the conversation setting the context for the meeting would sound something like this super grateful for this hour together and you know the purpose of us coming together today is i wanted you to meet my senior partners so that you could have an experience of our team and our organization and how we work and at the same time satisfy this next layer of due diligence due diligence that you're going through to make sure that you get what's important for you during this time she said my senior partner she didn't use the word upline mm. bad she word use, cancel cancel never say upline she didn't say my boss my mentor it's always my business partner my senior business partner whatever you feel fine using but you stay away from mlm words and you stay away from stuff that belittles you, the person making the introduction. Like, I'm not competent to have this conversation, yeah. so that's why I brought this person in. Right. Don't do that to yourself. Right. That's not what it's about. So setting the context is key. Think of that as why we're here. And you might think, well, we know why we're here. However, when you state why we're here, it brings everybody energetically and mentally into the room and into the meeting. All right? So setting the context is the second thing. Edify the prospect, meaning the most important person in the room is the prospect. It is not Rick who has an organization of over 1,700 agents. It is not anyone else. The most important person in the room is the prospect. So edify means literally to tee up. How many golfers do we have? I know we got one. How many golfers do we have in the room? What's the purpose of a golf tee? Get it off the ground. To get it off the ground. And when you get it off the ground, what happens when you go to swing at the ball? Less traction less friction it travels further if you do a great tee up a great edification that conversation is going to be able to travel much further than it is if you don't do that the reason why you edify the prospect first aside from them being the most important person in the room is sometimes people go well why, why can't i just talk to you like i don't know this person why do i need to talk to them and so when you do a proper edification of the prospect in the beginning, what happens is three things. Number one, you're able to in break the ice. Number two, you invest in the relationship. And number three, you now have their ears. So let me tell you why. Breaking the ice is they get introduced first, like attention's on them. How you edify someone is Rick, what I like about you is, Rick, what I admire about you is, Rick, what I respect about you is. And it's what's true, and it's what your experience is of that person. No matter what, when you leave that meeting, you've invested in that relationship because words of affirmation, which is a huge love language for people that don't get affirmed enough, they've just been acknowledged in the time that they spent with you, which means they feel good about being in your presence. So. Yeah, Rick, what I love about you is how much you love people. Rick, what I love about you is, no, no, I already did love. <laughs> Can you see we're married? <laughs> Rick, what I respect about you is you have one of the most powerful work ethics of anyone I've ever met. Right? Rick, what I admire about you is that you're willing to fail and fail and fail and get up again and again and again and again. If you do that and you watch the body language, the posture, the face soften, you now have brought that prospect's full attention into your meeting. Do you do all three of those at the same time? No, those are examples. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to do like a run through so you can have an experience of it at the end. Those are just whatever you resonate with based on your relationship with that person. And so now any walls that they had of thinking, oh, this person that's this third party validation person, this senior partner, this business person is going to hammer me about EXP and try and convince me to join EXP. This is what most people are thinking, right? This is just what they think. And then you give them a totally different experience. Their walls have come down and you're only in the introduction. Edification is huge. The second person to edify is whoever your senior partner, your business partner, your colleague, whatever you want to call them, is the person that's going to be facilitating the conversation. Why are we edifying that person? Because the person
person doesn't know them and you're bringing respect. Exactly. Build credibility. That person doesn't know them. Bring them respect. I don't want Rick sitting down in a meeting and saying, hey, I used to own nine Keller Williams offices and I was one of their top speakers, trainers, and coaches during the years I was there. Because now Rick sounds like an arrogant ass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't put your partner, sorry, don't put your partner... <laughs> Don't put your partner in a position to have to talk about how great they are. When you edify their partner that's going to take over that call, like, man, your prospect, the goal is for them to be feeling like, holy cow, I'm getting 30 minutes with this guy? How did that happen? Right? So when I edify my senior partner and say, you know, while I really respect that at one point Rick owned nine Keller Williams offices and was one of the top speakers, trainers, and coaches um, when he was with Keller Williams, what I admire most about Rick is his care for people. And what I love about them is that uh, what I love about him is that he is absolutely committed to making a difference. So in 30 seconds or less, I just did an amazing introduction and edification of that senior partner. The longer your edification goes, the more inauthentic it will feel. Yeah. Think. Go ahead. Where you start to lose the prospect. Yeah. When we've talked to people about this, Casey's much better at teaching it to people on our team. But then, what, so when I've taught it, sometimes they just don't listen as well as they do when she's being direct. And my, when they're introducing me, it'll be going on and on. And you can't do it because you're on Zoom and the customer can, the prospect yeah. can see you. I'm like, shut up already. Like, <laughs> I'm bored and it's me you're talking to. <laughs> so it's, did you hear? This one doesn't have to be 30 seconds or less. It'd still be better to, but this one, no doubt, you got to keep it 30 seconds or less yeah. because you don't want that big puff they had yeah, yeah. going away. Yeah. Yeah. They still want to seem like the most important person in the room. So. Thank you. And they are the most important person in the room. So um, a proper edification, like what's going to happen after this is like butter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you see how that would be? Because you've laid a foundation, you've taken the time to lay a foundation. Um, we did this training for someone that, uh, for a group in our organization, I did this training on Tuesday, and one of the people that was on it had him on a three-way call, um, three-way validation call. Was that yesterday? Who are we talking about? Shh, no names. Oh. Um, and I'm like, whoa, no clear the time. She went right to introducing Rick for her people that were there, and energetically, it just felt heavy. It was like, ooh, 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 right? Versus an experience that can be created when you really integrate this. How do I know this? Because um, it, it works, right? Um, so my background for 13 years is in direct sales and network marketing, which is recruiting. Mm -hmm. That's what I've done for the last 13 years of my life. Built, uh, an organization in 17 countries using mm -hmm. these concepts. Yeah, so I learned this outside of EXP. However, skill sets are transferable whenever you're working with human beings, mm -hmm. right? You take these skill sets and you, put, you take this into your buyer and seller console. You take it anywhere you go because it raises the value of the conversation that you're having. And it just, I mean, it's an amazing experience if you learn it and do it. Then what happens is great. Um, these introductions have been done. The, the conversation gets passed to the person that's going to do the validation conversation. What is your job as the person that's brought the prospect now? Zip it. Under any circumstance, do not open your mouth unless asked to speak. And here's the visual I want you to think of. If it's a tennis game and your prospect's on one side and you've handed it to your senior partner, they're going to have a conversation. They're going to pass the ball back and forth in conversation. What happens if you jump on the same side as your senior partner now and are hitting, ba hitting balls back? It's two on one. You have energetically created a two on one experience for that prospect, which is push energy, which is what pushes people away. You want to create a pull energy experience where when someone leaves the conversation, they're like, man, I want more of that. I definitely want some more of that because they've had such an amazing experience. So you the higher, the higher the D or I are in the person, the, uh, uh, the person who brought the third party validation in the prospect, the harder it is to get them to keep their mouth shut, even if they've learned this. <laughs> right? So here's our thing that we do. We just go, oh, excuse me, mute. This is all you do. Yeah. You don't say stop talking, just like, hey, mute. Did you forget the mute button? Yeah. Mute. You're like, That's you train your, your people, life. right? You don't want to embarrass them, but you've really got to get them to stop talking, if, especially if you're the senior partner that's doing the talking. It just ruins it. Yeah, so like how you redirect that is, I, I love the value that you bring to this conversation and can we come back to you at the end?
That's how you stop someone that's forgotten and is now vomiting in and wants to play two on one. You know what? I super love your enthusiasm and your passion. And I want to make sure that we, you know, whatever value you wanted to add gets added to this conversation. Can we save it to the end? Right? Because otherwise, like somebody that's doing a validation call knows where they're going and they're taking a direction. And if you are in a different lane and a different direction, you're derailing the conversation. And now you're playing tug of war with your senior partner or validation call person that's there to help and support you. And you've lost the power and the impact of what's possible by doing that. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, the other thing that happens is you've spent the, you've teed it up to edify your expert, right? And then when you speak, you actually de-edify your expert, and the prospect says, well, you know, I think I just work with Casey. I, like, I don't need to talk to Rick. It sounds like you have the answers, too. I'll just work with you. Exactly. Yes. Yep. And actually, for, you know, like a, a guy like Brent, if he hears this going on, next time you call him, how's Brent going to feel about saying yes to you? Exactly. Correct. He's like, dude, you don't need me. You derailed the last call and took it over. Like, why do you need me? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Don't be that person. Okay, next thing, when the senior partner receives that, let's assume they're meeting the prospect for the first time. Remind me what your name is? Lexi. Lexi. So if Rick's brought Lexi to the conversation and all this has just happened, I will say something like this. Lexi, thank you so much for taking the time to connect today. Since we're just meeting each other for the first time, tell me a little bit about you. Now, somebody who in the, in the DISC profile is an I, an S, or a C, is going to do that. Somebody that is a high D is not going to want to talk personal. They're going to want to get down to business and they're going to take the conversation over and tell you what they're asking or what they want to know, which is fine, right? Care, competence, right? So you could say, you know, Lexi, since we're just meeting each other for the first time, would love to learn a little bit about you and then find out what would be most valuable for you during our time together. The number one mistake that somebody doing a third party validation call makes is whatever they're excited about, they just want to share that. And the bottom line is it's usually going to take one thing to recruit someone and you don't know what that one thing is until they tell you what it is. So the person that's asking the questions controls the conversation. It is not the person spewing EXP information. So this is a great way. So Lexi tells me a little bit about herself. I'm listening for like key things in Lexi's story. Where's Lexi's pain? Why? I want to find that pain and I want to jab my finger in it <laughs> once it comes to my turn to talk, right? I want to take that pain and kick it up a notch to create a vacuum of like, oh, wow, if I don't do something about this, right? The next thing is gathering an agenda. Awesome, Lexi. So what would be most important for you during our time together? What can I share? What questions can I answer? What would you like to know? And Lexi might say one thing and we're not playing tennis now. This is called fact fine. Okay, great. What else do you want to know? Okay, great. What else can I share? Okay, great. What else? What else? And I get her entire list of what she wants to know because we've got 30 minutes together or we've got an hour together. And if there is, if number five is the most important thing on her list and we spend all the time on number one because I'm going one at a time, I have not created maximum value for that call. So I want to know everything that's most important for Lexi so she gets everything that she's looking for during our time together, during our conversation together. And Lexi's like, well, that's it. Okay, great, Lexi. If there was one more thing, what would that be? What's your one more thing? And whatever that is, she might go, oh, well, there's this. Oh, well, no, that's it. Okay, great. So now I've got this agenda that's just been gathered for our conversation. And my job now is in the time that we've got left, based on how much time we've set aside, whether that's 30 minutes or whether that's an hour, I can look down at my watch and go, okay, it's 3.32, we have set till four o'clock. I essentially have about 20 minutes to get through her agenda items because of what needs to happen after that. And I can manage the time through telling stories or giving examples or challenging the way that she thinks or going back to what I learned about her when we were building rapport, whatever her pain point is, where she says, man, every year I'm working to beat my sales the year before and I can go fantastic. Do you want to be having that same conversation a year from now, three years from now, five years from now? If you don't make a change or do something different five years from now, we're going to be having the same dialogue, right? I can take whatever her pain is and I want to highlight it. So once we've discussed all of that, the most important thing is this. Lexi, what's next for you? Based on what we've talked about today, what would you like next? How many of you have an issue with follow-up? Everybody raise your hands, please. <laughs> 
The reason why you have an issue with follow-up is, I'll tell you because I've been in enough of these conversations as I've traveled the world for the last 13 years, the reason you have an issue with follow-up is because number one, you're afraid to ask for the business or the close because you don't want to be perceived as pressuring someone. And you don't want to ask for the next date and time because you're afraid they're going to go the other direction. So for somebody that's high competence, where being competent is high on their values, if you don't do that at the end, what you communicate is what you have to offer isn't that important. If you do that with somebody who is sincerity based at the end and you don't have a specific next step of what's happening and when, you just communicate to that person that you don't care about them or what they shared or what they want. I had someone ask me the other day, well, what do you use as a CRM to automate your follow-up? And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, you know, well, like, do you have things so you can just, you know, um, email distribution lists and so they get invited to events and this. And I'm like, no, like that person is like a helium balloon. If I leave a conversation and I let the balloon go without a next step, a date and time on that next step, they're gone. They're not going in a CRM file. It's what makes sense for you, what's next, and when. Like date, specific date and time. Oh, let's catch up with next week. That is not a specific date and time, you guys. Next week comes and next week goes. Specific date and time. Now, for somebody that's clear, they're going to tell you exactly what they want. For somebody that's maybe not so clear, and you've had an experience, the better you get at doing third-party validation calls, you're going to know to give someone three options, and it doesn't matter which option they pick. It's going to advance them and move them forward in the process. So maybe after we've discussed that, you know, Lexi, so that was everything that you were looking for today. You know, was there anything else, that, else that's come up in the time that we've been talking that would be important for you? And she says no, and now there's this, like, hang. I want to go great. I'm directing the conversation. So in the context of next step, there's a couple of different directions we could go. Number one, you may want to hear from someone else that has a different perspective, in which case I want to introduce you to Brent. And Brent has created amazing things in a very short time with this company, um, you know, locally and globally. And I know that I could get 15, 20 minutes with him that would be valuable. Number two, you may want to have an experience of the world and what that feels like, in which case we could schedule a date and time to do that together. Number three, you may want to have something specific that you can research or look at that gives you more information that may have come up based on our conversation today, in which case we can find out what that is and I can get that to you. So of those three options, what makes sense for you as the next steps? Or step number three might be you were ready to go 10 minutes ago and it's just about us getting online to do the joining link together. You know, sometimes we'll throw that in there. Like, where are you at? And that person will tell you exactly what they want. And then all you've got to do is set up the date and time to make sure that they get that. And if you walk people through this process, like then you come to the next conversation, you do the exact same freaking thing over and over and over again until they go, I'm on board, I'm joining. Right? So this demonstrates a high level of care. It demonstrates a high level of skills. And you will not need to talk to 100 people to recruit one. Your conversion ratios will go through the freaking roof. And if you teach your organization how to effectively use third-party validation and you start doing that for them, you may not be that great at the beginning. However, you're going to get better the more you do it. Yeah. Nobody escapes the 10,000-hour rule to mastery. You've got to do it 10,000 hours to become a master at it and be willing to go through the practice of doing that. Might be a little clunky. Yep. You want to say something? I want to say, who's excited that we recorded that? Yeah. 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 So um, here's the bottom line. If you can systematize recruiting, you can create duplication. When you create duplication, you can get scalable growth. This is not about you going out and personally recruiting 100 people or 500 people or 1,000 people. This is about having people empowered and confident to have conversations where you're replicating that because everyone feels like they can do it. Can anyone set up a three-way validation conversation? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, anyone can do that. 
So what could that look like? You're on the other end of a transaction and you train everyone that you work with in your organization every time they close the deal to call back that agent and say, hey, I just want to say that, you know, I really enjoyed working with you on that transaction on 123 Main Street because of how diligent you were about meeting timelines and the care you had for your client. My experience of you is that you're an industry professional and you want to stay at the leading edge of what's happening in our industry as it continues to evolve. I don't know. Am I wrong? No, no, no. I am. So there's a platform that's completely disrupting the future of our industry and whether you participated in it or not, it's going to completely change forever the way real estate professionals work. Would you be willing? to sit down and have a conversation about what that looks like in the event that you want to participate and link arms with leaders of leaders and being part of that change or sit and watch us do it. Ooh, right? If you just did that at the end of every conversation and then you said, fantastic, you'll give me 30 minutes on Wednesday. Let me tell you who I'm going to get during that 30 minutes. He's been in the industry 40 years. He's a speaker, trainer, coach, blah, blah, blah. And I'll make sure that I get time with him. Let's pick three times that can work so I can check with his schedule. What's three times that work for you? Can you teach everybody to do that and let somebody else talk to your people? Yeah, you can. So here's what it looks like. I'm going to run through it real quick. Start to finish because that was in snippets and I want, you to, I want you to have a feel of the experience of the flow of that before I pass it over to um, my yeah. favorite human in the world. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to, in this scenario, I'm going to have Rick, well, I'm going to switch because I want you to hear my word tracking and, and just modeling of it. So I'm going to have Rick and Marguerite be the two people that are helping me in this scenario. Rick's going to be the prospect and Marguerite is going to be um, the senior partner, okay? So we're gonna go back to this so that you can watch it. And you're just Oops. gonna be the agent that brought the senior Yeah, partner. I'm gonna be the agent that brought the senior partner. Oops, wrong one. We'll get back to our little stickies so we've got a visual. All right. But the stinky, which screen you want? It's the next one, here we go. Not that one. It's the one with the sticky notes. Okay, so Can we just pull up the okay, whole thing? Yeah. We'll just do that. Perfect. All right. So Rick's my prospect. Marguerite's the third party validator. And we, um, I may be on a call. Generally, it's going to be on a Zoom. So Rick, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your day today. I know it's like 3.45 right now and we're scheduled to 4.15. Um, before we jump into this conversation, I just want to make sure now is still a good time for you. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, um, the reason for us coming together today, I know you and I have been talking and exploring a couple things about eXp. However, the purpose of today was for you to be able to meet somebody that I really respect and admire, to hear her perspective and be able to ask questions and bounce ideas um, off during this time together and you know whatever else would be important for you. Marguerite, what I want you to know about Rick is that he is somebody I hugely respect. He's got 40 years in the industry. He used to own nine Keller Williams offices and he's a key speaker, trainer, and coach in the industry. But what I really admire about him is his willingness to fail and fail and fail and get up and be better every time he does it. And Rick, what I want you to know about Marguerite is that Marguerite is a person who is an absolute visionary. She has a heart of serving other people. She's super humble about her success, but she's owned brokerages. She's been in the industry for, 27 years. I would know this before going to the call, for 27 years. And one of the things that I love and respect most about her is that she's a fighter. And she's, she's scrappy and she's willing to get in and be in the fight when it comes to making a difference in other people's lives. So I'm super grateful for both of your time during our call today. And Marguerite, I'm going to pass it to you. That's the setup. Marguerite takes that. I'm going to be Marguerite in this conversation. Rick, I'm super excited to meet you. I always love making relationships and collaborating with other professionals in our industry. And aside from learning what will be most important to you during our time together, you know, we're just meeting for the first time. So I'd love to know a little bit more about you. Tell me about yourself. Okay. Okay. He's done. So, 
I'm going to listen to Rick's story, and I'm going to hear his story, and then the transition is going to be, I'm always going to like, what are the key things that were the most emotional for Rick and his story? Rick, I get that you've got a really incredible work ethic, and that starting over in your 50s from nothing must have been a pretty painful place to be and, and bleak. So, uh, you know, I feel for you having experienced a lot being in this industry as well. Highs, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. But you know, we only have 15 more minutes together and what I would love to know is what would be most important for you uh, during our time together? What can I share? What questions would you like to ask? Tell me about what would be most important for yeah, you. One, two, three. One, two, three, great. So then we're going through those agenda items and as we transition, so Rick, um, you know, what you said that you wanted to discuss today was da, 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 did, we cover everything to your satisfaction. Is there th things that came up as we were talking that you'd like to know more about? Yes, yes, and no. Yes, yes, yes and no. Okay, fantastic. So um, in the context of what's uh, of next steps, what makes the most sense for you? What would you like next? I want to see the world and some of the education platforms. Okay, great. Here's a key question. Would later today or tomorrow be better for you? Not when is good for you. Would later today or tomorrow be better for you? Sure. Now. Now is always the time. Yes. It's not, hey, can you do it now? And we're extending the call time. No, because I want to keep to that 30 minutes. Mm. I want people to know that they can build in 30 minute pockets of time. So I don't have time is never a freaking excuse, mm. right? Yeah. If I sit down and have a two hour meeting with someone and they think they've got to go do two hour meetings to build an organization, I've killed my duplication and scalability. 30 minutes, guys. Multiple 30 minutes calls is way better than one two hour meeting. So I totally want to support everything that Brent has said. And in the send and chase, here's another way to do it. In the setup of the meeting, if they're open to talking, great. I have some homework for you. I'm going to send you an overview to watch. Your job is to watch it and put three questions together to come to our conversation tomorrow to have an educated conversation about what you've seen and heard. You give them something to do and have them agree to do it. They may need to change the call time if you do that. However, you've gotten that agreement up front. If they come to the call and they haven't done it, you've got 30 minutes set up. Hey, you know, we're going to check in on what was most interesting to you and answer any questions. Uh, oh, yeah, I didn't watch it. Awesome. We've got 30 minutes right now. Boom. Roll the video. So you're never having to chase someone around. You never send a link. We, don't, we teach our people never to send a link without a committed time to speak later that day or the next day. Never send that link. You want to control the exposure or watch it with them directly as Brent coaches and all the other great stuff that you heard today. So, uh, yeah, for sure. So did you set up three ways before they watched it and then their assignment is to watch it? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you lead into three-way based on not even having them to get to the conversation yet? Just what we did earlier? Or they close the yeah, so they're gonna have a, you're going to have a conversation about this platform that's revolutionizing the industry. Right, And one of the things I love most about being here is the collaboration and the teamwork. And so when we talk tomorrow at noon, I'm going to have somebody that I, co uh, that I collaborate a lot with that I really respect and admire. You don't even have to say the name of who it is if you're checking with three different people to see who's available at that time. Right? So they already know there's going to be someone coming into that conversation and now it's like, here's your homework. I just want to confirm you for sure are going to have that done by the time we talk tomorrow and have at least three questions put together. Right? If you're going that route, we've seen that it works really well. Um, okay, so next steps. What would you like as next steps? Or give them three things. And there's one thing that's not on here that's really important. Um, Rick, what I want you to know, regardless of what you decide, is that um, I'm going to imagine that Marguerite is the person that's brought Rick to the conversation. Rick, what I want you to know, regardless of what you decide moving forward about EXP, that if this is a fit for you, you could not be in better hands than you are with Marguerite. She's the best of the best. So at the end, like the full Which circle is on the that yeah. is the senior partner edifying the person that's brought. This has completed the circle of the conversation. This is all 30 minutes. You can do this in 20 minutes. I challenge you to do it in 15 minutes. Like you can have fun with it and get really great at it if you're willing to take it on as a skill set. And it might be kind of clunky at first. So you might look at it and go, oh, well, it's going to feel mechanical and like I'm running a process on someone. And that's just a whole bunch of like crazy stuff you're making up in your head that's not true because the experience on the other end is people love it and they step into it. Did you, like how long did it take you to run this process? And did you have any, 
Do you have notes you followed? Because I feel like yeah. if you get two minutes in, you just would have these. Yeah, I would have these sticky notes up in my office. I learned this process about nine years ago. And after about 200 times of doing it, I felt confident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I felt like I could do it. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm starting to get this. And if I was like babbling on, I'm like, holy smokes, I edified in the incorrect order. Holy smokes, I forgot to gather the agenda. Uh, and I would have the sticky notes up wherever I was at just to keep the rails on the, you know, the bumpers on the bowling alley, right? <laughs> so yeah, you got to get in there, you got to play with it and practice it. So uh, with that, we are super, super grateful. I just want to say as I pass this to Rick for the rest of our time here, um, we are super... It's okay. That's not true. Super <laughs> grateful to um, Brent and James yeah. and Rob. And uh, Joey, you had a question, buddy? Yeah, so just so I'm clear, as far as the what to do next to when, yeah. they haven't seen the video yet. They have. They have seen it before you went to this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, question. Question. So you booked the time. Right, and then uh, the market's so crazy right now, they're like, oh my gosh, I got a listing appointment. And in their mind, that's priority. I got to reschedule, I got to cancel. So now you've gotten into this somewhat of a chase to, re you know, you've done all the time to get them into a locked in appointment. Mm -hmm. And now they text, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm slammed. Can we bump it? Can we do this? What's your technique to kind of bring them, reel them back into a. Yeah, so. A lot of times the setup goes into that is listen like this time on my calendar I have moved aside everything else including meeting with buyers and sellers like this is your specific time so when I'm making the appointment like I want to make sure this is no matter what a good time for you mm -hmm. so there's a way posturally where you can say like this is your specific time in my calendar I am rearranging my schedule in my life to give you this 30 minutes I want to make sure for sure that this is going to be a good time for you she and also then taught me a question she did is there any reason for me not to believe this is as important in your calendar as it is in mine? Is there any reason for me not to believe that this is as important in your calendar as it is in mine? Right? You asked and, them. You didn't tell them. Right? Yep. And then the last thing is, if for some reason, like, God forbid, a family member, something tragic happens with them, you know, and like, would, which would be the only reason why you wouldn't keep this meeting, um, please let me know as far in advance as you can. 24 hours is ideal, right? And then we'll get you rescheduled immediately so that I have someone, I have that time for someone else because this time has been specifically reserved for you. Yeah, so you edify the appointment time of your calendar in their mind so that when they cancel, you have that law of reciprocity. They're like, I want, okay, yeah. let's get back on the calendar. I apologize. Yeah, and then um, when working with your organization, like if they book your time and it's like, oh, well, the person canceled, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I don't care if the person you originally intended for my 30 minutes canceled. You go get someone else for that 30 minutes because I'm giving you my 30 minutes. Right? I don't do cancellations if I'm working with my organization. I will give anyone my time and as much of it as they'll ask for third-party validations. However, that is your time in my calendar. I don't care who you fill it with. It just needs to be someone. What that does is now like we're bringing like we're asking people to step up to level up to like bring their game up right and I mean the only way I can help you build your organization is if you put me in front of your people if you put me in front of your people I can help you build and grow if like me training you me talking to you is not going to help you build and grow the only way I can help you grow is if you put me in front of your people and with that my time is gold right I'm willing to make the investment in you honor and respect my time. Rick doesn't do that. You don't have to do that. But for me, right, that's important for me based on how I like to work. So you get to decide how you like to work. I'm obviously a little intense. So, you know, that's just like I don't ever want to be frustrated because I've got gaps that were scheduled. I don't want to have that experience. I love being able to help people. So I'm going to be on the phone helping people. I'm energized to be able to do that, which means if I'm back to back on the half hour doing that all day long, that's like the greatest day ever. I end the day with more energy than when I started the day, right? Because I'm doing the thing that's my passion and purpose about being in front of people. And I've got an organization of people that are respecting that time and bringing key people that we can help impact together into those conversations. Like that's the greatest day ever. Ever, ever, ever. Okay, I have way talked over Rick. Rick and his, uh, yeah. For starters, this was amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, is there any opportunity? Do you have maybe like a recording of this? 
Yes, it's right there. I wouldn't record without someone's permission. Um, I don't have one for that reason. However, yeah. You know how you get that is you go do them and you bring yeah. prospect to a third party call and then you listen. Yeah. yeah. So that while you're doing it, you can be making money and growing your organization. All right. So uh, here's what I want to say about Rick as I pass it to him. Everything I said in the edification and introductions were true. However, um, here's what I want to say about EXP and Rick. We've been together for 13 years. And a lot of those years were really, really rocky. And some of the rockiest times during those years were between November and February 1st when the real estate market fluctuated because of being with the most incredible man that I've ever met that was starting over with a lot of debt. And last year, this time, was the first time that we didn't think about that at all. And the experience of being able to not check budget not check what's coming in, not check bills, to be debt free, to have invested elsewhere because of what EXP has brought to our lives. It's not about the money, you guys. It's about the peace of mind. It's about the peace of mind. And so I have never experienced, when you have peace of mind, you have the ability for your purpose to bubble to the top, to bubble to the surface because you're not in the addiction called, where do I make my next buck? Where do I close my next deal? And watching that transition that's happened for him, I have seen the most incredible pieces and parts of him that didn't have the space to arise when we were under financial press and pressure and stress. They were always in there. However, they do not shine as brightly as they do today. And I'm so proud of you for you're just like willingness to keep getting up and getting up and getting up. And regardless of what's happening, you get up and you go. And I love you. All right. I'm only going to seriously take a few. Emotion of drain. I do want to say publicly, I've told a lot of people that. I just told Jeffrey uh, that. I've told James that. I've told Brent that, that we've all been fortunate enough to be the kind of person that you can attract somebody much, much bigger and better than you that are able to see what you have potential. Mm -hmm. um, Casey pursued me. This is actually part of the story, and there's a lesson in here. I'm not saying it because you need to know about my romantic past. Um, but Casey pursued me and my girlfriend, who was Bev Steiner from e Keller Williams Realty, who was also the owner of the KW office that she worked in when she was an agent. Um, and she pursued us for two years, twice a month, to attend a personal development class. Right? She wasn't looking for a boyfriend. She wasn't looking to piss off my girlfriend. Uh, and that's what was going on. She was pissing off my girlfriend, even though she was a top producer in her office. And, um, and uh, then that lady and I broke up. And Casey had no idea. I wasn't on Facebook at the time. It was pretty early. And she happened to pursue me again. And I said, yeah, I'm willing to talk to you about it. She didn't know I was broken up. And we went and sat down. She's 18 years younger than me. We went and sat down at a restaurant in Walnut Creek. And I just listened to a girl that was 32 years old telling me at 51 years old all about life and results and happiness. And I was astonished during the conversation that someone so young could see so much into the future. Um, I've always told people I'm not a visionary, but if I catch someone's vision, I'm taking it to the moon and back, right? When I heard about Keller Williams, I was resistant, just like I was to Brett, but when I saw the vision, I took it to the moon and back. Yeah. She said one thing that changed my life in that meeting. And we were not dating or anything. She was just a girl that wanted to tell me about a personal development program. When I asked her, I said, I can see why you're pursuing so many people. I want to know why you're pursuing me specifically. You've attended my classes. We really don't know each other past that. Um, she said, oh, that's simple. I see you much bigger than you see yourself. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That freaking floored me. I didn't know her well enough to cry in front of her, but I definitely could feel a lump in my throat. Right? I was almost 51 years old, and I'd never heard those words before from anyone. 
especially the amazingly loving Lebanese family I came from. <laughs> but they, they, never, they never said I wasn't that or that I wasn't bigger than I was showing up. But what that means is being willing to surround yourself with somebody who sees what you're capable of, right? And holds you capable to be that person, which is the most uncomfortable thing in the world for the person receiving it. Right? So what did I commit to? To surrounding myself with people who saw me bigger than I was, yeah. would hold me capable, wouldn't accept, excuse my language, my bullshit about why something could or couldn't be done, yeah. and would say, you're bigger than that. Or hold up a mirror with no judgment and say, I'm just saying this is what's coming out of your mouth, but this is what's going on in your life. Yeah. It's the reason why we've been together 13 years and only married five and a half of those. Because there was no way she was going to settle to marry somebody who was still in the habits that weren't working for getting me where I wanted to go. Now notice, I did not say it was a good, bad, good or bad or right or wrong habit. I said it was a habit that wasn't working for where I wanted to go in life. Where I was saying to her I wanted to go in life. Alright? I had nine offices with a thousand agents in them. There was two things that we went to bed every night, me and my partners, praying for our agents to do. And you all know what they are, but you wouldn't be able to verbalize them unless you owned nine offices and had a hundred grand a month going out every month to keep the doors open. Mm -hmm. Right? Like when, why, One of the reasons I love Brent so much and feel so close to him is his financial losses sound exactly like mine. Like I lost my entire retirement. I left owning brokerage with a 484 credit score and 1.4 million in debt. All right? That was in my 50s. Shortly after that, I had two uncles that had been in real estate for 50 years. One died nine hours after an open house. All right? Broke. His average sale price of the homes he sold was $4 million. Two years later, my other uncle dies in his office on a Friday night. That other uncle's little brother, they didn't even find him until Sunday. Broke. 50 years in real estate. That ain't freaking happening to me. Yeah. And it won't happen to you if you take seriously what this company has offered us. And don't ever let me hear, because of EXP, this has happened for me. No, because of you, this has happened for you. Because of you, you decided to take that vision and work with it. I have never RV'd in my life. <laughs> Dirt last year, I took 71 flights. Casey took 65. Okay? We're sitting during COVID, right? We're thinking to ourselves, hey, I like you even more. It's one thing to love your spouse. It's another completely thing to like them. <laughs> Believe me. If you don't know this, you better go home and test that out. <laughs> but I realized how much more I liked her. She was on the other end of the house doing webinars, and what's something that was so cool that she doesn't even realize made such a difference for me is that whenever she would be done with her webinar and not hear me on a webinar or on a Zoom call, she'd bring her computer and sit next to me. Mm. Right? We had had a dog five years ago, but right after he died, we stopped... We started traveling a lot, so we didn't have a dog. Easter son, our dog's name was Koa. Unusual name. A lab. Beautiful lab. He died. On Easter Sunday of this year, which is right smack during COVID, I see a neighborhood uh, uh, next door ad come in my email that says, Koa is looking for a forever home. I get chills. I show it to her. I get emotional thinking about it. I go, babe, this beautiful Rottweiler is called Koa, and he's looking for a home. Wow. And he's like six years old and 80 pounds and freaking gorgeous. Like if you were going to make out with a dog, it'd be <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we get the, we bring the dog, we, we, we send it back. Look, we live, we live alone, no kids, no pets. We work from home. Our former dog was Koa. As soon as they heard that, they're like, hi, do you want to look at this? It was a rescue abandoned dog, right? Mm -hmm. So we get Koa. Turns out he wouldn't answer to the name Koa, so we tried Bubba and he loved it. Right? So his name is now Bubba. This, uh, was there one more? Did I say uh, Just the two. She said put it on top. Oh yeah, so, so this is, we, we now call this Bubba's rig. But we took a trip 
uh, what, one of my dreams. I want to remind you guys that sometimes your dreams that you've had all your life will show up in a package that doesn't look like what you expected it to look like. I've always wanted to do a TED Talk. I have not shared this with anybody except personal family, so you're the first to hear this. Sweet. So in, in June, early June, I got a call, and I was requested to become an instructor for the online universities for Forbes. Mm. Forbes Media, one of the largest media companies in the world. Mm. And uh, they wanted me to come and start filming. Like, they're, I'm talking production, like TV production filming. Mm. So on the way down in my, our Range Rover, which the whole back end of it is a $1,500 crash-proof crate for Bubba, yeah. <laughs> we packed our suitcases into the back seat and we're driving down there. On the way back, we're like, let's not fly anymore. Let's just go everywhere and take Bubba with us. And then we realized, well, it's, we need more room. And that started a conversation talking about a Mercedes Sprinter van or whatever, and for three weeks in a row, from 9 p.m. to midnight, no joke, we, she and I sat on the couch and researched RVs. We had all our friends tell us, just rent one, right? We bought a four-year-old RV, Bubba's Rig. It's 43 feet long, filled with our stuff, it's 50,000 pounds, right? And we got it, and Within a couple, uh, about 10 days, we were on a 60-day trip around the United States. Wow. Hitting up all our EXP groups, doing business planning clinics, Casey teaching leadership classes, mm. all around the U.S. It was the most amazing experience of our lives. And during it, you know what I kept thinking? How I used to say that if I leave my business, it will falter. We booked $22 million in business while I was on that rig, huh. our team, mm. right? We brought at least a hundred more people on that we were aware of, not counting all the ones that were adding during our system, during our, uh, what's going on for the rest of my team around the country. The reason I wanted to just have a few minutes to tell you that is everything I heard today, I took notes, I'm going to do some things differently in my own recruiting, but none of it will work if you don't stop looking backwards at your failures and keep looking forward at what's possible. Yeah. Seriously, like catch yourself in this freaking thing called your opinion, okay? Your opinion, your perspective is the bull that's keeping you from what's possible. Whatever it is, you know your weaknesses better than anybody. When she asked me to start uh, meditating for the eighth time in our relationship, I was like, babe, we've meditated. It's like... <laughs> she said, no, 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 we should. We got to meditate to Dr. Joe Dispenza. We started meditating to Dr. Joe Dispenza, starting with 15 minutes a morning, then it went to 40 minutes, then it went to 75 minutes a morning. We were getting up earlier and earlier, and things started to happen. And one of the parts of the meditation was asking for the universe to send you a sign that you could see how amazing the future is. Every single time I'd wake up and there'd be a text from somebody I'd been working on saying, okay, it's time we talk. And then we hadn't meditated for a while. Last Monday we meditated again, the long one, the 75 minute. And I hadn't looked at my phone, right? We got up at five, I hadn't touched my phone. And finally I wake up and I look and this couple that I've been working on from Grass Valley that moved to Tennessee are like, okay, Rick, we're joining, we're ready to join. I'm like, you know, Crazy stuff, but it starts with you just looking forward and always having in your mind what's possible, not what's not possible. What will go right, not what won't. Have a freaking story in your head, then have it be a happy ending and quit making up stories that have sad endings. Mm -hmm. yeah. All I want to do, I'm going to get my hip replaced in a week and a half. Mm -hmm. I'm having some surgery in my mouth. I got about six weeks of physical therapy, and then we're gone. Mm -hmm. We're gone again. And that time, I don't know that I'll be coming back. Right? I've always had a dream. I've always had a dream to have a house on the water, any water. Right? We stayed uh, for 50 of the 60 nights we were gone. We were on water, lakes, rivers, streams, oceans, all over the country. It was freaking incredible. I can't even tell you. And you know where I got this? I heard Glenn Sanford's vision, but I didn't hear it from Glenn. I heard it from Brent. And your responsibility is to tell other people Glenn's vision from you, not from Glenn or Brent. You've got to do it with passion and say what's possible. What's possible. That's all I got.